Okay. So we're three minutes in. I want to make sure that we get as much time with our guests as possible. So I'm going to go ahead and get us started and then people will just join in as they come. Um, so first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our next episode um, on uh, in our series of the Gaza Chronicles where we are talking to people that are working um, across different sectors from, you know, mainly from the philanthropy sector, but just across different aspects of philanthropy in how we are addressing uh, the genocide in Gaza. And so today's, the focus of today's uh, conversation that I'm having with our two guests is around education. Um, and, you know, we know uh, that the loss of life and the loss of families and homes and the loss of hopes and dreams in a genocide is obviously monumental and incalculable. Um, and, you know, specifically around um, education, and I don't know if any of you have been hearing this term come up recently, specifically in, in relation to Gaza, but the scholasticide in Gaza, um, which is like literally the decimation of kind of um, the education system and this deliberate attempt to like erase a people. Um, and, you know, we, so I'm, I'm half Palestinian. And so I've been kind of giving a little bit of this introduction um, at the start of every one of our Gaza Chronicles episodes to kind of explain that, you know, part of why we're doing this series, it's, it's part of our uh, speaker series. And, but we've made it made a specific kind of sub group to talk about, um, the, you know, the different aspects that are affecting Gaza in the midst of this genocide going, you know, 11 months in. And one of the things that I, you know, I keep wanting to, to mention is that as much as for the Arab Foundations Forum, this is, you know, part of our professional obligation, but it's also a very personal um, issue for us. And obviously what's going on in Gaza is, al is also something that's very, um, very personal for us. Two members of our AFF team are part Palestinian. Uh, we also have, you know, a number of Palestinian um, foundations and members that are part of our network. So overall, this is a really kind of uh, just a, a very personal issue for us and something that really hits very close to home. So when we talk about the issue of, of education, you know, if you're if you're a Palestinian or know anybody who's Palestinian, you know that uh, Palestinians in the diaspora and in Palestine are some of the most highly educated um people in the world. And this is a very intentional thing, right? So education is very much a form of resistance. Um, and it's a resistance to the to our erasure. It's a resistance to the ethnic cleansing. It's a resistance to occupation. And it's a resistance to this genocide. Um, and, you know, so we, we live, breathe, and kind of uh, embody this resistance on a on a daily basis. So anyone who's part of the Palestinian diaspora knows this, and anyone who is Palestinian living in Palestine knows this. That we we take our education very very seriously. And so to think about what's been happening over the last eleven months and this complete decimation of the education system and all the institutions that uphold that system is really devastating on every single level, but it's also devastating on a, on a level of identity because so much of Palestinian identity is built on our pride in education. So um, I'm going to kick us off with, uh, you know, some just basic introduction of our speakers. And as you know, if you've been following our series, we've really um, made it kind of the point of these episodes to have conversations with our guests. We don't want it to be a webinar that is kind of like sterile. We want it to be a lot more intimate. We want to be able to engage our guests in some more of the intimate conversations around their vulnerabilities, their human interactions um, as, it, as it kind of pertains to this genocide. And obviously also give them a platform to talk about what they've been doing and the interventions that they've been spearheading. So, uh, you know, I'm going to get us kind of into um, a little bit of context for why this conversation is happening specifically around education. Um, you know, as I said, Palestinians place a very high value on education. Um, and some of the kind of data around what's been happening, according to UNESCO and the Palestinian Central Bureau for Statistics, 
the overall adult literacy rate for people who are aged 15 and above, that's kind of the definition of adult literacy rate in Palestine is approximately 96.3%. So this is like numbers as of 2021. The literacy rate for youth aged between 15 to 24 is even higher than that. It's almost 100%, so it's around 99%. Um, and in terms of higher education, a very significant portion of the population pursues university education. So somewhere around 30 to 35% of Palestinians aged between 18 to 24 are enrolled in tertiary education, which includes uh, universities and colleges. In terms of the scholasticide in Gaza, numbers kind of coming in as of July, 2024, about 625,000 students now have no access to education. You know, around the world, the new kind of um, scholastic year started sometime end of August, beginning of September, beginning, you know, depending on where you are. This is the second year in a row where students in Gaza are being deprived of kind of the first day of school, the back to school day. Um, about 85% of schools have been directly hit or damaged in this genocide, requiring either full reconstruction or very significant repairs or just making it um, impossible to function. 9,773 students and 409 educational staff have been murdered. Um, and these are just the numbers that we know of, right? So obviously, I mean, I think the numbers are definitely going to be much higher than that. Um, all 12 universities in Gaza have been bombed, resulting in their complete or partial destruction. But 88,000 university students cannot access higher education. And at least 95 university professors have been murdered. And these are numbers as of April 2024. So that's quite a, a, a while back. So again, we know that the numbers are much higher than that. Um, you know, our uh, Nihal, our... Um, because the project manager will include the source for all of this. It's Visualizing Palestine, but we can include it in the link here in case you want to get any more in-depth information on these numbers. Um, so today, we're talking to two guests, two women, who are beacons of this resistance that we're talking about and beacons of hope in their own way. Um, they have contributed to the preservation of Palestine, to the preservation of its youth and education for its youth. And in turn, obviously, it's very future and it's very existence. And so they've been providing hundreds of students with educational opportunities, and they've nurtured and supported the need not only to succeed um, in achieving their degrees or educational goals, but really in kind of keeping this dream of Palestinian education alive. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two speakers, our two guests, and then we'll delve into, I'm going to hand over the floor to them. Um, delve a little bit into some of their journeys and what they've been doing, and then turn it over to the participants for your questions. Um, the way that we do this, you know, we have a, a chat uh, function, but we also have a Q&A function. Um, if you are so inclined to ask a question, please go ahead and ask it whenever you're ready to. You don't have to wait till the end. What I will do is towards the end of this episode, I'll then pick out the questions that we can answer. Um, we don't always get to all of the questions. We don't always get to everybody's comments, but I try as much as possible to do um, what I can to answer all of your questions. So if you can put the questions in the Q&A, that would be great because it's just a lot easier to keep track, but I'll be monitoring both the chat and the questions just in case you forget. So our first guest that I want to introduce you to is Dea Leonard Dresner. Um, Dea is a very interesting, has a very interesting background. So Dea's family is kind of mixed. Her mother was from Nazareth. Her father is from Tennessee, from the great state of Tennessee. Um, and her father was an educator in the Middle East. So this provided Dea with kind of this cross-cultural understanding of, of challenges um, that students can face kind of, you know, um, across different um, um situations and kind of instances and uh, circumstances. Dea is the founder and the executive director of the Le of LEO, which stands for the Leonard Education Organization. And I'm gonna let Dea give us more about her background. But a fun fact about Dea is that uh, before she kind of got into this whole, you know, let's provide education for Palestinian students and students around the world, she was also a, an inter international fashion model. Um, so that's kind of an interesting segue from the, the world of fashion into the world of education. And then our next speaker is Isra Ali, who is the founder of Ahdaf al-Zaytoun. 
Isra is a Canadian Egyptian um, with just a passion for making a difference. And she was raised outside of Egypt, but has always kind of had a connection to her heritage and her roots. Um, Isra has a background in project management, strategy, program development. So she brings kind of a wealth of that experience from both the tech sector and the nonprofit sector. And again, I won't, I won't tell Isra's story. I'm gonna ask her to tell her story herself in her own words. Um, so with that, I'm just going to say welcome, Dea and Isra. Thank you so much for taking time out of your days to join us. Um, and Dea, I'm going to start with you and just ask you, please tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us a bit about um, how you kind of went on this journey to then found Leo. And give me a little bit of kind of background on what specifically has drawn you to this issue, education specifically, and today, what does that mean in the context of what's been going on in Gaza? Uh, thank you, Naila. Thank you very much. Uh, I also look forward to hearing about what Isra is up to. Um, well, uh, the question is, why did I get into this? Well, I was raised by an educator. My Baba had a PhD from Harvard in 1950, showed up in Ramallah and uh, has, was Dean of Students at AUB, taught at the Friends School in Ramallah, worked with UNESCO, worked with UNRWA. So as you can see, I was sort of uh, indoctrinated in the story from a, a very early age. So I started off as a model. I hadn't been a good student myself. In fact, I was a terrible student. Modeling was an easy way. Uh, uh, but because uh, of the pressure from home that I, I, I was just a model, um, I started uh, doing other things besides modeling. I started producing. I produced ad campaigns, special events, uh, commercials, um, using. And, and so when I was given the opportunity to uh, or started thinking about establishing Leo, I was running into students, Palestinian students that had been brought over here in different programs and basically just dumped. Uh, mm. And they were reaching out to me saying, you know, we, we need more support. We're away from our families. Our families uh, don't understand what's going on. Uh, we need a little bit of extra money here. There was, there's a very high failure rate amongst our youth who travel overseas for an education. Mm. Uh, so I started looking into it and uh, they asked me if I would help them establish an organization that they could uh, establish the standard operating procedures, help run it, um, and, you know, be more in control, be stakeholders. So I did, uh, with absolutely zero knowledge, uh, of how <laughs> to even set up a website. <laughs> so, wow. uh, it starts from scratch, uh, but I learned along the way. Um, I learned a lot of things and the students, obviously, you know, they come into my computer, they tell me how to do things. And, and over the 10 years I've been doing this, I've learned a lot from them. Uh, we learned about the challenges. Uh, the students helped me set up like questions. We work with the very poor. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, Bidun Wasta is mm -hmm. what we call them. Students Bidun Wasta, families Bidun Wasta. Uh, but it's really extraordinary. I, I've learned an awful lot. Uh, so it's been a fantastic journey for me too. I've learned about our people, where they come from. So I document where the families originally come from, where they ended up. Uh, I have noted that our people have different challenges depending on where they live. We, mm -hmm. we work in Lebanon, Jordan, West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, in the Trump days, when the funding was taken away from the Palestinians, uh, we started getting a lot of requests to fund students back home. Uh, so we started doing that and, and we had to vet the students. We're, we're extremely good at vetting and the older students taught me the trick questions. Because if mm. you can imagine a young person who has nothing reaching to the top, they've had to manipulate, uh, they've had to be very resourceful or I call them the artful dodgers from <laughs> Oliver Twist. Mm -hmm. They know what to say, especially to what they consider a charity. I, I know technically we're a 501c3 charity mm -hmm. status, uh, but we aren't a charity. One of the things that the students used to complain about is, you know, we're working with human beings. When you're working with mm -hmm. a human being, you can't, there's no such thing as one size fits all. 
every student's need is different. Every student's need needs to be addressed. Um, and one of the things I noticed is that because they're young, uh, but also could be the uh, sort of the, the field we're in, you must respond quickly. Responsiveness mm -hmm. is extremely important. Uh, we get very little notice to move students across borders, uh, put them in school, fund an emergency. Um, and we're able to do that because we've not put too many rules and regulations in our mandate. I, I think mm. that's, that's very important to note. Um, I've learned a lot about the NGO world. Uh, fascinating. And one day I will publish my book or as some mm -hmm. different told me after I'm dead, I should publish it. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it's really been a, a, a very interesting learning journey for me uh, to understand exactly what our people actually have to go through. And it's extraordinary what challenges, uh, it's mind bending, mind boggling, you know, sending the students through transit through some countries, it's impossible. Um, it's, I, I feel like really, um, thank goodness that I had a production background. So I right. joke that actually my modeling background has been very useful. As a model, right. obviously, I was pretty successful. I mean, I was in the business for 31 years, so I must have been pretty successful. Um, Amazing. So as a model, I've learned rejection. So that makes me a mm -hmm. good fundraiser, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't take things personally. But as a producer, I have learned to respond very quickly to anything. You know, the phone is on 24-7. I can get up and go back to sleep very easy. That's not a problem. When mm -hmm. students are crossing borders, uh, flying, there's often issues, thank goodness, for the internet because we're right. able to guide them. We, we're heavy on, we, we learn a lot from each other and that's uh, helped us support the students to the best of our ability, prep them for visa interviews, um, how to dress, what to say. I mean, very, very simple things. Um, yeah. we've learned the short fallings of their previous education. Uh, we've learned their strengths. One of the interesting things I've learned is that, you know, the West makes fun of our rote education back home. Right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I will, I have observed that it's the fact that our students have studied and become really good at memorization that enables them to settle in and do well their first year in a totally different country and a different mm. environment. We're now in 18 countries around the world. Uh, so it's not just America. We started with America because this mm -hmm. is where we are. This is where the scholarships are. But it's important mm -hmm. for people to know we don't actually pay for the education of the students. We, we source existing scholarships, which makes mm -hmm. it a lot cheaper for us. Then we, we identify, prep, and match the student with the university. And because we take very good care of them, we've developed a reputation. We, we take care of everything. Lost passports. What 17-year-old young man does not lose their passport, right? Right. And losing mm -hmm. a passport from that part of the world is a complicated situation. So yeah. um, the, the program is really quite complex, but we work together. We're all volunteers in this program. Um, and I really think that uh, that and the fact that we respond very quickly and we're action driven uh, is one of the reasons why we're very successful. Ultimately, Amazing. our goal is to prepare mm. this younger generation. One of them is to raise them together so they get to learn what it's like to have been a Palestinian raised in a Lebanese camp versus somebody from the West Bank, Gaza. Uh, and I, I really love to see that. I love to see when uh, I, I notice that during a break or internship, they're, they're hooking each other up. They're staying in each yeah. other's places. They're, they're, they're sharing books. There's a lot of things that these young people are now doing together. And imagine what this group of young people is going to look like 10, 20 years from now, opening doors for each other, guiding each other, helping each other with CVs, et cetera. So this is fantastic. So they're learning about each other. Ultimately, of course, I, I'd like to see uh, these leaders all getting together and having a really impactful uh, uh well impact on our society mm -hmm. at some point right mm -hmm. some people have accused uh, our program of being a brain drain uh, i i wish i wish i was taking thousands of youth and giving them this opportunity a year you know 10 15 20 kids does not make a brain drain uh we're educating them what they do with their lives is their own business what i do know is that they give send money home to their families they're mm -hmm. they're dedicated the the poorer the students, I've noticed, 
the more they are, the tighter they are and the closer they are with their families. They mm -hmm. don't have the sense that they want to live abroad. In fact, if you ask half of the students that are studying in this country, in the US, uh, where they plan to settle, it certainly won't be here. Mm. So they're going where the work is. Uh, they are stepping up. They go home to volunteer in the summers uh, in their camps. Um, and so I, I'm really, I'm, I'm very pleased with the results. And uh, by offering them dignity, uh, support in every subject, any topic, nothing is taboo, mm -hmm. no judgment. Um, mm -hmm. I think this has been one of the, the key successes uh, in our program that these kids start to flourish. They get for a few minutes to be young people, uh, enjoy college life um, with a lot of stresses removed from their lives because we step up and, and you know, they know where their safety net. Yeah. You know, I think what's amazing. So there's a couple of things. So first of all, um, I completely relate to the production side of things. So my previous life before I got into the nonprofit sector was also in, in production. Um, I used to be a producer for Sesame Street, um, the children's television. Yeah, yeah. So I spent about 13 years um, producing international adaptations of Sesame Street around the world. And, in, and interestingly, again, like, you know, I always make, you know, the same sort of um, correlation between my life as a producer and again, international production, because like I was based in the New York office, but I was producing shows in 17 countries. So 17 countries around the world and in very, you know, in varying different uh, contexts. And I, I do say, and, and really half joking, that um, dealing with the Muppets... <laughs> was a lot harder than NGO work, <laughs> a lot harder than nonprofit work. Um, even though nonprofit, you know, the nonprofit sector is, is quite a challenge. But um, so I have that same sort of appreciation for the skills that I got as a producer and how that's allowed me to be flexible and agile in this sector that is often ever changing. And, you know, it kind of needs a certain type of, you know, figuring it out and being able to be resourceful, it's a resourcefulness that you kind of learn from, from. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so I completely appreciate that part of your uh, of your experience as well. But one of the things I really wanted to understand a little bit more from you, because what you what you do is very unique in, in a sense in that your organization isn't only just sourcing the financial kind of support for these students and these kids, but it's really also supporting them in their life. Like I know the first time we met when we talked, you, me and Nihal, you were telling us about how you were about, you know, you had a graduation ceremony sometime, I think it was in July or May or May or June or some, some, somewhere okay. in the summer mm -hmm. in North Carolina and that you were going to drive personally to North Carolina to go attend the graduation of one of your students. And that's very different than what a normal foundation does, right? Like, a, you know, a foundation gives a grant or gives a donation or gives support or whatever, and then sort of I don't want to say walks away, but that kind of in you know intimate relationship where you were there representing the family of this person to watch them graduate is kind of it's exceptional. And so actually, you know, tell us a bit about that particular student. I just want to like what happened with that. Oh, I'm not gonna tell you about that particular student because Oh no. He, oh no, I'm gonna tell you that the school he graduated got a superb uh job offer as a nurse and his school international advisor messed up his OPT application. Oh. This is the second time it's happened this year. So this is exactly oh. why our students need Leo, we double check everything. We ask them not to mm. leave their campuses, travel, do anything without double checking with us uh, because it's complicated. Mm. <clears throat> um, the schools try very hard to support the students, but don't always give them the right advice. Well, we've learned mm. the hard way. And unfortunately, I, I think there's going to be a resolution for this, but this, is, this has been one of the um, challenging things this summer. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, well, another, what about another? Like, give me. So I'll tell yeah. you that. what's very important yeah. to us and anybody is that these young people are getting on an airplane for the first time in their lives in 95% of the cases, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they need to be picked up at the airports by somebody and then delivered to their schools. 
if mm -hmm. they go on their own and the schools do pick them up, which is fantastic, you know, a lot of international students don't have bedding, towels, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. when they get to school. A few days later, they take them shopping. We ensure that these things are waiting for them when they get to campus so they can, they don't have to sleep on a hard mattress with uh, their backpack as their pillow their first night. They can take a shower. So it's it's really in the details, as is anything in life, if you want to do it properly as a producer, you know, it's yep. in the details. So we are very careful to make sure that we help them settle in in a positive way. Of course, we we have uh, some of the older students have made videos on how to. So we're, we're very big on post and uh, pre-orientation so that the students can visualize what they're going to be expecting to take away that fear. Uh, mm. And then, of course, we travel with them the whole way. Our phones are open to them to give advice, whatever. So so I think that helps them settle in well wherever they go. That's mm -hmm. vital. You know, you know, mm -hmm. as a tourist, when you go somewhere new, you're lost. You, we don't right. want them to have this sense of insecurity and loss when they start. We want them to feel confident. Um, but yes, you're right. We work on many things. Soft skills development, very important. Uh, critical thinking. These are things they have not necessarily experienced in their uh, education prior to uh, leaving home and going anywhere in the world. These are very, very important uh, attributes. And oh, absolutely. Very, very important. And I and I think really, I mean, again, just you telling me like this, you know, this extra detail about making sure that these kids have like a kind of a welcome packet, right? Like a welcome care package waiting for them. I mean, listen, I'm, you know, I've traveled the world. I travel for work all the time. I just moved um, from my home in Cairo to a new place in Dubai a week ago. And the first thing I did, I mean, Walid from my team will tell you, the first thing I did was what? I, I made sure that I had linens and towels and like cozy candles and stuff waiting for me when I arrived because that's that's what I'm so I can't imagine if I was you know first time ever going to a new place a new continent um at 17 and not having any of those kind of creature comforts waiting for me that would be I mean again I just feel like that's such a that's such a critical detail and it's such a small detail, but it makes the world of difference. So well, I mean, imagine being one of these young people, if you can for a minute, put yourself in their place that, you know, they're all raised the education. We all are as Palestinians is, is vital. You know, mm -hmm. failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. So they all of a sudden find out that they're coming to university or they're going, they're leaving home, going to university. They've won the lottery. They're euphoric, yes. right? Mm -hmm, then there's mm -hmm. the fear of the preparation and the reality that they will be now leaving. So we, we need to help them manage that. Then mm -hmm. as soon as they arrive uh, on their campuses, the depression sets in. The weather changes, it's fall. Uh, they're no longer able to communicate as readily with their family. Daily conversations are harder. They're in a different time zone. All of these, we monitor them very, very carefully their first um their first months it's extremely mm. important settling in right is extremely important for anybody and especially for these young people who have not experienced this they mm. often think that jet lag is depression so mm. you know we point out no you're tired you're exhausted you're in a different yeah. time zone it's called jet lag yeah yeah so so Dea, one of the things i wanted to also you know given that we're focusing a lot also on how a lot of these interventions are specifically um, geared to the situation now and, and the, you know, the genocide in Gaza now um, and scholasticide in Gaza. So I want to, I just, you know, Leo, you guys have been doing this before all of this, right? You've been around for how many years? How, how long years. has Leo been? Ten years. Ten years. Okay. So you've been around for a while, but I just, if you could talk to us a little bit about specifically in this moment in time, with what's going on now, A, how has Leo responded? And then B, how is it different? How is your job different today dealing with students who are now not only, you know, maybe going away for the first time, but also leaving a completely catastrophic situation? Um, in many cases, they may have lost family members. They may have, I mean, I just, I want to understand what is the reality of this moment now in the lives of the students that you're working with? Well, sleepless nights. Let's start with why, how we got engaged. We have students from Gaza who've been studying in Egypt for many years already. 
uh, on in November, I contacted one of our uh, medical students who gra was graduating in January, and I asked her what you know what's next. She goes, "Well, I have to do an internship here now. I've done my six years of study. I will now be doing an internship." And I said, "And where's that going to be?" She said, "Gaza." I said, "Habib D, Plan B, please." So we have at Leo a joke. We have Plan A, B, and Z. We don't. We never put all our eggs in one basket. So I said, "I need to know by tomorrow." So she contacted me. She said, well, I can stay in Egypt and do my internship here, but um, my Baba can't send any room and board because we were just paying for her uh, tuition. I said, don't worry, got you covered. Uh, then I asked her how many more students are in the same situation as you are. She said six, sent me a picture of six young women. I go, you've only got six young women in your class from Gaza in Egypt? She goes, oh no, there's 48 of us. <laughs> so uh, these were her six friends. <laughs> So uh, I brought this up at a board meeting sh very shortly after our conversation. And one of our board members said, let's do it. I go, let's do what? She goes, let's take on the whole class. I said, Have, is nobody listening to me in board meetings? Have you any idea? Uh, you know, taking 10 and now you're asking 48. So we looked into it. She decided, yeah, we'll do it. Then we found out that the curriculum had changed in Egypt five years this is for medical school five years of study and two years of internship so the oh. class below had graduated in december so we mm. took them on as well so we ended up with 117 young people so what was the next challenge then well i don't know if you know this but in gaza and in egypt you can be attending university and not pay the full tuition every year you have to pay mm -hmm. the balance once you graduate mm -hmm. uh so uh a lot of these students had not paid. Uh, the board member did an extraordinary job of fundraising. We collected close to $600,000. because, And wow. that's what it cost to pay the back debt of these young people, to pay for their internship year, and to pay for room and board for the year. Wow. So we are the only, we are the first and still the only organization who actually showed up stepped up for the Gazan kids studying in Egypt, took the whole class and ensured that they had everything they needed, room and board. Because some people are saying we're educating students, but they're giving them, you know, hundreds of dollars. That's fantastic, but that doesn't mm -hmm. cover. That means this young person is is stressed and worried from, from month to month how they're going to pay the bills. Yeah. Uh, the rent has gone up 50 to 70% this year yeah. on the yeah. students. Uh, everything has gone up. There seems to be fees now at the universities that never existed before. There's all kinds of things going on, but we are ensuring that these students complete their year. Now, what's after that? Mm -hmm. You know, putting a Band-Aid on the situation is not going to help. And we're against Band-Aids. Leo does not do Band-Aids. So we're mm -hmm. looking long-term of what do, we do, what do we do with these young people once they, they're GPs already, but when they graduate their internship, then they're going to need residency or research. So mm -hmm. we're working with hospitals around the world. We're trying to meet up with more doctors who are willing to take in these students. Uh, one of So we have students still in Gaza, medical students, uh, engineering and IT students who are still in Gaza. Okay. Uh, uh, some of them had gotten out to Egypt and one of our medical students is now in South Africa, Al Azhar, her university uh, coordinated with a university in um, Cape Town. Wow. Uh, so she contacted me, she said, I'm going, uh, I lost everything. So we replaced her computer, her stethoscope and her uh, lab coat. Mm -hmm. and sent it with a bit of pocket money so that she she's an orphan but from a previous uh time uh, uh -huh. and so it was just left with her mother and sisters it's uh yes it's complicated of course out of our students in uh, egypt there are uh they're they're losing their family members on a daily basis the 117 are not the only ones that we have sponsored. These are two groups. We've also stepped up to help pay room and board or tuition for students all over the country that have reached out to us and they fit our criteria. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be to give back, to have a sense of community. But uh, And we've attached uh, therapists for these students culturally that's what i was going to ask mm. yes of course we've made mm. it possible well we we've had therapists all along at leo 
um, mm -hmm. Arabic speakers, native Arabic speakers and English speakers, uh, because our students don't really relate to the Western um, therapists. But mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with uh, therapists in the region to help support our, our youth in Gaza and those uh, in Egypt. Unfortunately, Amazing. we're not able to, we're not in touch with our youth, our students in Gaza that often. Uh, my okay. concern is that they will be monitored if they're speaking to us, that their cell phone, um, there's one that stays in touch a lot and reports on the others. We have lost a student and I'm not, um, mm. I've not really mentioned it to our community yet. I'll write her story, our first mm. medical student. Um, and it's still something that's just very hard to digest. This was in, uh, in December. And I'm just thinking, what are the odds? You know, we're mm. a community of 300. What are the odds that we're going to lose somebody? Mm. Uh, we've gone through, we've had students who've lost family members while they were studying abroad in previous wars. We've. This is not a new experience for us. Um, yeah, unfortunately, of course. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we ha we have, we've dealt with it a lot. Uh, those students, uh, one in particular, has stepped up and, um, and is also a great resource for the students who are going through what they're going through now. Uh, again, teamwork uh, is is really, from my English education, uh, t t teamwork is great. Uh, mm -hmm. and, it's, uh, and it's really helped and supported the students. What we are finding in Egypt is it's really very complicated. And as Israel will be, my colleague Israel will be sharing with you, as uh, she mentioned earlier, is like, what is next? Mm -hmm. uh, are they, in Gaza, there are some online initiatives, but as I got a report this morning from one of the students, they're still iffy. Nobody really knows what it means. Yeah. You know, they're trying to go to classes. They're not going on a regular basis. So they're going to get accredited for it. So really accreditation is very important. If you're a Gazan in Egypt currently, uh, because the curriculum is different, the Egyptians are requiring you either start from the beginning, Oops. start university from the beginning, or you lose a year or two. It depends on your education, how far you are. If you're a second year student, or going into your third year, you start again from scratch. Wow. So on top of mm. not, you know, missing a year, these young people are now being told to start all over again. Um, this is extremely stressful and and very of unfortunate. Course. This needs to be reviewed. We maybe need to have some sort of accreditation system where they can be examined to see their level of of uh, understanding or advancement, and not force this young person to repeat the years of medical right. school. Um, like some kind of aptitude test to kind yes, of face them. Yeah, that's, mm. that's really important. I don't see that anyone is stepping up in that genre. I think we can learn a lot from um, maybe what the Syrians did, how they managed education after online education mm -hmm. in the future is probably going to have to be the way we go just because of the, you know, the amount of youth we have in our society. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. And there are ways, I think, of doing that positively, even though human contact is still, I think, the best. Uh, right. If you're doing online, how can you debate and discuss with your classmates and with your teachers uh, the very, very important aspects of education, you know, critical thinking and questioning? Of course. How can of you do course. that when you're online? It's, it's very complicated. I'm leaving that to the experts. Um, I'm not an academic, as I told you. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just really keen on um, making sure things happen for the students and supporting them in every way and every level. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that sometimes we start as early as high school. I believe personally that that's too young to take a young person from our culture out of their family uh, yeah. environment. But uh, out of desperation, some of them will take on these uh, fantastic international high school scholarships. So they do need support. So we'll step up. We don't encourage it. But we follow them all the way through to job placement. And for this generation, an undergraduate degree is not enough. So they'll mm. go on to uh, to study masters or PhDs somewhere in the world. And then, you know, now they're reaching the, the stage where we are, you know, working very hard to connect them back to the region with companies, corporations, institutions. Uh, we have... <clears throat> 28 already graduated 
We have a professor, an Oxford associate professor at Oxford University, one at University College London, a vice principal of a private school in the West Bank. So we have educators, we have engineers, we have scientists. Um, the doctors are all back home mm -hmm. because there's no money for medical school in this country. They go on mm -hmm. to do research, PhDs in research. But mm -hmm. you've got to look long term. So, uh, yes, we're addressing what's going on now, but we're also trying to figure out what is that going to look like next, next year, because our six year students are finishing their internship in January. We've already matched six of them for six, eight of them with uh, shadowing opportunities here in the U.S. for a month. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'd like to do that around the world. We'd like to because how I see it, they will need the training somewhere outside of home right. for the next three or four, five, six years. Uh, we need, we can't stop. We've invest, invested a lot in them and now we need what's next. And that's right. something that the community is going to need to step up and, and support the students with education. Yes. But then especially uh, the doctors, uh, a lot of people are interested in supporting uh, the medical students outside of Gaza because we've lost so many doctors. Mm, yeah, Just paying for the education is not enough. We need to help them with the next step so that they are prepared right. and ready to step up and work as doctors. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to come back to you um, once we've heard a bit from Isra as well in terms of what that reality is like from her perspective. But I will come back to you. So I'm going to give you the question now so you can kind of think about it. And then when I come back to you, you, you you're prepared. But, you know, I want to know we're you know, we're going to share with everyone here and everyone who registered, um, you know, people will, will get the, the the episode once it's finished they'll be able to access it online um but i want to you know we'll share the information on how to make a contribution how to donate to leo and all of that but i just i'm going to want you to talk us through a little bit of what is the funding mechanism to leo right so that people know kind of how that funding is made and one of the things that that is often asked now, especially because there are so many campaigns. I mean, you know, I've been talking about what's very unique about this Gaza situation um, from a philanthropy perspective. So I've been writing about it, talking about it, giving keynote speeches about it, is that, you know, as a sector globally and regionally, philanthropy hasn't really stepped up for Gaza in the way that we are used to in other crises and in other situations, and certainly not in any way that matches the potential that our sector has, even from just the region alone, but definitely globally. And so what has saved the lives of Palestinians in this genocide are individual donations, are people who are donating to GoFundMe campaigns, are people who are you know, giving hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to help get people out, to help you know get students to stay in school all of this so it's a it's kind of a unique situation i really predict this is going to change the face of fundraising um it you know fundraisers coming into this region and in this sector anyone who's interested in fundraising for catastrophe or conflict areas is going to have to kind of look at this as an example for how that can be done um and then i just think it you know when you look at kind of strategic philanthropy to me, this is a very interesting case study of how that how individuals have sort of upheld um, that part of the of the responsibility. So a lot of the questions that come in are questions around how do we know that, you know, the funding is going to what it needs to go to. I know I see thought it wrote to everyone to say, you know, contributions to Leo are, are tax deductible. That's kind of, you know, key for people in the U.S., but also that the admin costs from your side are practically none and that all the money goes directly to operations. So I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that. But just in the interest of time and to give Isra equal opportunity to kind of talk us through what Ahdef and Zaytun are doing, I'm going to transfer it over to you, Isra, first of all, to say hi and welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I want to ask you to tell us in your own words, who you are and what is Ahdaf is Zaytun and what are you guys doing and why? Yes. Um, so Ahfed is Zaytun uh, is an initiative that I started 
Um, the Palestinian cause is a very personal cause for me. When growing up in Canada, um, I was always involved in, uh, you know, I was in the student protests at my university to divest. I was uh, at the parliament in Canada in 2008 when there was, you know, when we thought this was a really horrific uh, attack on Gaza. And now in hindsight, looking at what's happening today, um, it was, you know, something so simple compared to the destruction of today. Um, I was also in a, um, it's called Ahiyat Turath Palestini, which means uh, revival of Palestinian traditions and folklore. We toured all of Canada. We did events. We hosted events to um, educate people, to raise awareness, and to also keep the Palestinian folklore alive because that is very much very important in the Palestinian struggle and identity. At mm -hmm. um, the core of everything, uh, you know, Ahmed Zaytun is an extension of my values and belief system. And when I was creating it, and I'll get to the story of that, you know, I approach the Palestinian cause that it's not just a humanitarian cause, it is a cause for liberation. So how do we put together, you know, framework that takes that in mind, uh, because in the, a lot of the NGO um, sphere, it removes the fact um, that there's an occupation. Like why are Palestinians in this position to begin with, right? It's just uh, puts Palestinians as people that need help. Um, what I bring in, in our core values at Ahfed Zaytun is no, there is a reason and there is a cause for this. And, uh, you know, one of the big things, and you will see, um, you know, photos of, of the children at Ahfed Zaytun, but the three that really inspired me to create this when I had come to Egypt just to see what I can offer and how I can help, um, you know, seeing kids and their mental health deteriorate and mm -hmm. their education deteriorate. That is the goal of the occupation. That is a goal to end that. And how do we create a space that combats that and at least uh, gives these kids a chance at being kids again? Um, so, you know, the the story of Ahfed Zaytun started like that. In hindsight, it started before I even created the space with just the three kids who are my friends uh, kids, she came to Egypt from Gaza uh, in January to seek cancer treatment, and it was just her and her three kids. Um, mm -hmm. They were in a shelter. So I, you know, when I would spend time with them, they were three, five, and seven. Um, first of all, you know, seeing the, the Zaid, the youngest one, experience depression, like he was two and a half at the time. And the anxiety of the planes flying and just the unsafety and his dad was still in Gaza at the time. So, you know, seeing this, I just felt suffocated by grief, like that mm -hmm. little babies are experiencing emotions and horrors that, you know, we can't comprehend as adults. Mm -hmm. um, so I started by getting them educational toys, Palestinian coloring books. Um, you know, taking them out to do some sort of STEM activities. And then I um, said, why can't I just do more with more children? I put out a call to action um, on TikTok. I made a video. I asked uh, Egyptians if anybody wants to volunteer with me and then we can like help educate and like rehabilitate the kids. Mm -hmm. um, I expected 30 volunteers, 50 families, you know, we meet them somewhere, we take the kids out. But what I got was um, my post blew up. I got over 7,000 volunteers. It wow. went, on, yeah, it went in all media outlets um, a lot. It was obviously local. It was uh, all Egyptian volunteers. They also felt that crippling grief that I felt and they wanted to provide something um, to Palestinians as much as they can because uh, also something that they can see that is tangible. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I was returning to Canada. So um, I, I was in Egypt from November to March. And I, that's when I posted the video. So I felt a very big sense of responsibility that people entrusted me to, to move forward with this initiative. So when I was in Canada, <clears throat> excuse me, I put out another call to action to see if there's actually people that will register. 
So mm -hmm. I put a call to action. Um, hey, uh, this is to any Palestinian parents that want to register their kids. We're going to focus on mental health and also use the Palestinian curriculum to get them to catch up and, uh, you know, kind of like a summer school. So um, I got 2000 children who registered wow. in the span of 48 hours. Wow. Um, and in that moment, I knew that like, I cannot back out. I, I have to, <laughs> I have to do this. I put hope in people's hearts and I, I actually have to move forward and, and make it work. Um, so I, what I did was like kind of an agile on <laughs> move as you go. I didn't care about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, raising funds. I just, we had such a short span of time to get this happening. Cause you know, if it's a summer school, it has to go from, you know, May to August so that we can mm -hmm. catch them up in a three months period. So I came back to Egypt at the beginning of May, signed a lease, uh, paid for the rent. I asked for my family and my friends to band together to create this, uh, to pay for the rent. Um, I put out a call to action for people to supply us with materials that we need, whether it's furniture, people donated drywall, people donated um, paint. It was uh, just like a community and coming together. And we made it happen. I registered it as a learning center. That was the quickest way to do it. Amazing. And yeah. So we registered, we got the permits, we got the space in, you know, I signed the lease May 9th. We launched May 20th. Wow. Um, so we took 350 kids, we created our website, we created our online portal uh, for the parents to input all their information. We got therapists, we got teachers, they created the curriculums, the uh, material that they're going to teach the kids. We took kids from the ages of three to 16. We wow. built the logistics on how the schedule is going to work. And uh, we just launched. We did a training with the therapists. Our, the most important thing was that we are informed of the trauma that these children went through that, you know, there will be cases where you just are dealing with an unknown, even as therapists. Like, you know, That's you absolutely. are not equipped with uh, the horrors that these children and even their parents have seen. So we did trainings with a therapist. She is actually from Gaza, but she resided in Saudi. So she had a unique perspective of like, I have my family there, but I live in Saudi and I also know the culture. So it's also cultural awareness for people. And mm -hmm. then we just started. We said like, we have to go, we have to do it. Um, everybody was volunteering. So we got, a, you know, people would uh, leave their work and come for our evening shifts and our day shifts. So these are the three kids that inspired me to do this. Um, and then in the yeah, morning, we it. had students that were on summer vacations who were, you know, engineers. And uh, we had doctors, pharmacists, pharmacists teaching science to 14 year olds. So we really um, just did everything very quickly in phase one, self-funded community got together. Uh, volunteers would, you know, help out with everything, um, bringing in cleaning supplies, bringing in food, snacks, that kind of thing. It was really just like almost like a co-op. Everybody contributed mm -hmm. um, a little bit of what they could, their experience, their time, material donations, and just like banding together. And um, yeah, over, I'll talk a bit later about it, but I can, you know, walk you through the journey of the beginning with the children and how we ended our three months, which you see a lot of these photos of the kids having fun and smiling. That was our, our last day of phase one, which was three uh, months. Amazing. That's incredible. So first of all, excuse me that I've been like mispronouncing, not even mispronouncing, calling it something completely different. <laughs> it's Ahmed and Zaytoun, obviously. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks for, it's okay. thanks for clarifying. Um, which makes so much more sense, of course. Yes. That's beautiful. I love that. I love that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is such, a, first of all, I love the, like, I love the, the, the journey stories that start with such a small, simple inspiration, right? So like these three kids, your, you know, your friend's kids, 
kind of like sparking this idea that kind of organically grows into this absolute, you know, incredible movement. But even more, the fact that, again, it goes back to what we were just saying in no the real interventions have come from individuals. So Mm -hmm. you having all of these volunteers sign up and all of these kids sign up, um, I mean, just the sheer number of the kids that you've had sign up for the Learning Center is is proof that no one else is like people, there's not enough of this happening, right? And, and, you know, and we know that the numbers of what's being, of, of what's being reported in terms of how many Palestinians have fled to Egypt far, you know, um, are, are far under estimates of what the actual numbers are. Just like we know, the numbers of, you know, murdered are definitely far, far, far more than what people keep repeating over and over again. I mean, we've been hearing, you know, 40,000 murdered since April. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's not the accurate number. Um, and so in the case of like, you know, when they, they say, oh, it's, you know, only like 70,000 people have, have fled into Egypt. I mean, I think I personally have heard of more than 85,000 myself. So it's, like, there's no way, it's, it's, you know what I mean? It's definitely more than 130,000. Absolutely. It's, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've been saying 150 plus. So yeah. that's kind of my estimate. It's 150 it plus. Um, so I just think, you know, again, like this is so, it's so interesting to me that we're seeing these kind of individual initiatives are, are, are what is kind of plugging this gap and this really immense gap. And I think it's wonderful and it's amazing um, and inspiring, but to go a little bit back to what Dea was saying is what happens next, Isra? Like what happened? This is, you know, look, we're 11 months into this. Um, you know, in less than a month from now, three weeks from now, we will be hitting the one year anniversary of this absolute catastrophe. Um, and it doesn't look like it's abating. You know, we, I mean, they, we know what just happened in Lebanon less than 24 hours ago. You know, we have members in Lebanon uh, that we reached out to today just to check in, like what, you know, how, are, you know, AUB is one of our, is one of our members. Um, so we know that this is potentially going to escalate, which means that the fallout from this and the consequences from this potentially will um, increase. Um, and what happens next? So what's next for Ahfad uh, Zaytoun, but also how, like, what are you hearing from the families and the students that you guys are working with about what their plans are? So at the time, and it's still the case, when I created it is because it was just online education through the West Bank, right? And looking at, you know, you have to take into account the spectrum of people. There are people that don't even have laptops. They don't have access to internet. So how are they going to get educated? There are kids that are six and seven and they didn't get the basics. Um, They can't read and write. So how are they going to learn on a cell phone? Um, There are families of nine children. What are they going to do? That was my thought process. And as somebody, I have ADHD. I know I cannot learn through an online, I cannot sit here on a laptop for hours. What about the kids with mm-hmm. learning disabilities? What about the kids who have ADHD, who are autistic? There, there's a whole plethora of things that are not being considered. And, right. you know, I think the world expects too much of Palestinians. You fled a genocide. You are injured. I have kids that were under the rubble. You know, so how do you expect a kid who was under the rubble, their own, they're the only surviving member of their family, and then you want them to learn and, and be able to grasp the information that is given to them through a tiny cell phone, if they're even privileged to do so, and for them to not, with, with their grieving and everything, to actually have their brains be able to learn, that is just too much. So Mm -hmm. that's why we had Ahfad Zaytoun. I believe that the children need a physical space. They need to foster communities. They need to get out of that space where they are suffocated and unable and don't even feel like human beings. They don't have a normal routine anymore. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that was the issue then and it's still the issue now. Um, I saw the children of Ahfad Zaytoun and how much they've grown and healed over a three months period of time. In terms of what is being offered to them right now, it's still online. 
Azhari schools in Egypt are taking some. Um, and that is about it. Um, mm. If they do not have a um, Iqama, so residency in Egypt, they cannot enroll, well, they can enroll in private schools, but they will not get a certificate. So again, you're spending so much money, but because of your legal status, because it comes from the government, right? The ministry, there's a high chance they're not going to get certificates. So then what is the point? So we have shifted our phase two into truly an after-school program so they're going to be going online in the mornings or if they're going to Azhari schools in the mornings. And then in the evening for the younger kids who really, you know, have it the most difficult, they're just starting to learn how to read and write. You can't do that online. So we mm -hmm. are focused on, you know, enriching their reading and writing skills. So they are going mm -hmm. to take Arabic, English, math, science, and we're going to continue art therapy and our physical activities for leisure. Um, and we're also going to have therapists on site. As for the older kids, um, we have decided to um, give them skills that can actually get them scholarships for schools. So we started like a programming course where they are going to learn graphic design, programming, um, you know, just everything that can help them with web development, applications development. So even mm -hmm. if you know, the, it gives them skills in the future. Like we're trying to think ahead, you know, to right. get careers, even if they don't have a degree, they can just have the portfolio. They can create that. Um, we're also teaching some of the kids skills like accounting, uh, business essentials, uh, social media management. So again, like we do not see the, f we do not know what is going to change in the future for them. So mm -hmm. we've decided to enrich them with skills that, either can get them scholarships and get them into universities or give them skills that they can get jobs with. And, you know, the online sphere is huge. Um, so we're equipping them uh, with the skills for them to be able to uh, get jobs in the future. That is for the older yeah. kids. Um, yeah. Yes, we for so long, we were in limbo because the parents were in limbo. I didn't know what our next, are we ending in August? Because the kids mm -hmm. are going to be going to schools in September okay, no, we're not ending in August. You know, I always like to say that we were kind of an emergency response. Yeah. It needed to happen. They needed a physical space and Ahfad Zaytun was it. And now we are shifting into, you know, giving them the skills and the education that are, that will help them outside of the regular schools to get jobs and all of this stuff. And I don't know what the future will hold, depending on what the situation, how the situation goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, look, I mean, it's, of course, it's the unknown. It's, it's, uh, there's no way that you are going to know yourself what's coming next. All of that, I completely understand. But I think um, one of the things that I really, so I have, a, I have so many questions based on what you just said. So I'm going to ask you one by one. So first of all, just to confirm something for me. So you're saying... I mean, my understanding was that kids coming in from Gaza and families coming in from Gaza, first of all, don't get, um, they don't get iqamas. I mean, unless they already have one. Yeah, exactly. So they're coming in on tourist visas, which means that those are 30 days, they expire, and they're overstaying their visas. Or they can renew it, yeah. Or they can re continue to renew it. Okay, yeah. so that's one question. But then, so in that case, you're saying now they can't, um, what I've understood is that they can't apply to register in regular, just everyday schools or can they, but they don't, they're not like, it's, it's kind of like auditing. How does that work? Yes. So they can apply through the Azhari school system, which is a completely different curriculum, um, you know, and it's, it's a huge wait list. So they, I know okay. some people applied and got accepted. Um, some okay. people are waitlisted. Some people don't want to apply because it is a difficult curriculum. It is challenging and it's completely different for the children. And the parents want to continue the Palestinian curriculum. So what those parents are doing is they're enrolling them with the, the Palestinian Ministry of Education, which is just online, um, online learning. So they are on their mm -hmm. laptops uh, or cell phones. Um, so these are the two options. The third one is some private schools have said, 
you know, you can register with us. We will take you. But the kid, you know, they're most likely will not be able. We cannot promise you that the kid will get a certificate that they have completed this grade with us because it goes through when they submit their reports, it goes through Al Abbasaya. And the Abbasaya is the, the government where the ministry and all the paperwork is processed. And if you don't have residency, then they cannot issue you because you are not a resident in Egypt. So the, the only purpose for that would be to get the kid out of the house, get them in a routine and have him learn, but he will not get um, a certificate. And there's a high chance he won't. And these are, so this is private schools, but then are, I mean, are we talking like private schools, like CAC, like that kind of private school or well, are we talking um, about, it's like, I mean, Private schools like, um, you know, just privately owned. Uh, there was one that's called like Fatima Zahra. It was in Medina Nasr, you know, a lot of people um, applied there and they told them like, yeah, you can register and we'll see how things go. But they're not going to promise you that they're going to be able to give you a report card and a degree at the end. And so, yeah. and in this case, like for, for in private schools, if we're... I, I, are they having to pay the same fees like everybody else? I mean, I know that it, I mean, there's a there's a gamut, so it's not like um, I know that there are some private schools that are cheaper than others. But like I know, for example, some that go up in the you know thirty thousand dollars a year. Like, how are these? Yeah. Are, are they expected to pay that? Yes. Yeah. Like I obviously, there's probably some schools that will give you know a discount or try to help out. But from the parents who reached out to us. Um, they have told us, like, they, they were asking if we were going to have a phase two, because it doesn't make sense for them to pay just so that the kid can be, you know, in a community and have, you know, have that routine versus going to an initiative that will not cost them anything where they get to do the same thing. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, for the most part, it, people will pay fees. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's, that's like a, a whole other you know, yeah. layer of complexity to something that's already, I mean, just getting, just having people try to leave to get out of Gaza in itself per person was like bank breaking. So I can't even imagine that they'd have to, wow. Um, okay. And then the other question I wanted to, to ask you just so that I, so I can get a, a, like a concrete sense of what you're telling me. So talk me through again, what is like, this physical space that you've created. So how many kids come to this physical space? What are the ages of these kids that come to this physical space? And what does their day look like? Malish, okay. talk me through it again. No, no, it's, it's okay. So um, the age group is three to 16. Like okay. we, yeah, we broke them down into four groups. We took on, you know, the um, like refugee crisis type of framework where because all the kids will be behind, you can group kids like three to six can be together, six to nine together, nine to 12 together, and then 12 to 16 together. Um, so the 350 children, we cannot take them all at once. So we group them like 115, 115, 115, or, you know, and each group of these kids comes twice a week. So they okay. either come uh, Tuesday and Saturday, Thursday and Sunday or Sunday evening, Monday evening. So we had morning shifts and evening shifts. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the morning shifts, it's the same as the evening shifts. Volunteers come, the kids take uh, eight subjects. So mm -hmm. um, they take uh, four in one day and the other four in the other day. So I'll talk you through the older kids. They would come mm -hmm. in, they would take um, English, art therapy, uh, physics, uh, and Arabic one day. And then the other day they would take uh, masrah, so theater, um, mm -hmm. and they would take uh, chemistry. And mm -hmm. um, what else did we have? Math and mm -hmm. religion, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it was just like, you know, the, the four subjects on one day and then the others, um, on the other day, and we try to, you know, balance them out between um, like leisure and mental health activities. Like we also did group therapies, like we would switch the um, leisure, uh, the leisure, like one hour, 
you know, sometimes they would take music. Sometimes they would do a group therapy with a therapist, just things mm -hmm. like, you know, that they would enjoy. And then the other ones to maintain their education. So the Arabic, the English, physics, uh, chemistry, um, all were the Palestinian curriculum. So we had the Egyptian right. teachers learn the Palestinian curriculum and based wow. on that, create the uh, material for each class. Okay, so that's incredible. So I, I, there's a question that is very relevant to this from the, the participant Q&A. So Aleya is asking, um, first of all, she's letting you know that she just shared the link for Ahmed Zaytoun with one of her husband friends who's looking to put her 12 year old kid and she's hoping that she'll be able to benefit from it, which is awesome. Um, but she was asking, is there a plan? And this goes to my question about what's next. Um, is there a plan to provide any kind of formal certification through the Ministry of Education in Egypt? Or do you know of any kind of initiatives looking to do that? Because, and, and the reason I want to understand this a little bit more is you're providing this based on the Palestinian curriculum. It's awesome. But you're not you're not a, a registered like school, correct? So even this year that these kids, let's say it goes, let's say this goes on for another two years, who knows? Yeah. Um, what happens to them when they, you know, when there is one day, Ya Rabb, inshallah, in a free Palestine, um, these kids get to go home. How do they reintegrate back into an education system, which is a pipe dream, I know right now, because we're not, we're, you know, we're talking about Gaza with zero infrastructure and no schools and any of that. Um, but just like, what's the plan in, in those two cases? So from the very, very beginning, I always said, we are not like, you know, I always, I always said it in Arabic, like, Ehna mish badil lil madrasa. Ehna, like we are an add-on. So we do not, uh, we are not a substitute for school. We are just like an add-on to the school. Um, and that was our framework then. And it is still now. Um, the way that the kids are going to get their certificates is through the West Bank, through online. Or if they are uh, doing the Azhari, they will get an Egyptian certificate. We do mm -hmm. not have the intention of becoming a school um, because that is just a whole different ballpark and a lot of paperwork. And, you know, it's, it, it's not something that can happen overnight. Like the ministry mm -hmm. getting you accredited, you then become, you know, uh, like, we have to rewire our whole structure in terms of we have to hire teachers you have to and we are our space is not even that big to become a school so um we don't have the intention to do that mm -hmm. our intention was always to just help the kids in their mental health help them grow and take on the framework of an after school program you know right. it, we were kind of like a summer camp. So that's why we operated during the mornings and the evenings. But now we are just operating, we're starting to operate in the evenings so that the kids can finish their school, online schools, which you know is, is faulty in a lot of ways. And we can fill in these gaps, right? Like right. The, the, right. because the kid who's just in front of a laptop doesn't get to socialize. Oh, well, they get to come and socialize. The kid who's a visual learner, cannot do that through the laptop. Well, now they have the space to do that. So we kind of, you know, fill in the gaps and whatever, um, you know, the, the, the spaces or the downfalls of online learning is, we will support that. So that is right. what we do, yeah. Incredible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, this is all so, it, I'm so appreciative of just, you explaining, you know, both you and Dea explaining the process of what you guys are going through and how you've put it, how you've put this in motion, because it's such an overwhelming task. And this is such an overwhelming, again, like I truly believe that this is a paradigm shifting moment in history, right? And I think, you know, I think 10 years from now, um, we're going to look back at this and really see that these are the initiatives that kept people going. Like I'm, I'm really being serious. Like I'm not even trying to be, you know, mm -hmm. soft and and um, yeah. and sentimental about this. I genuinely believe this is the truth, uh, because, again, coming from the philanthropy sector and looking at incredible initiatives. Like, don't get me wrong. This isn't that there hasn't been 
intervention on other scales. Of course, there have emergency, you know, in, in emergency interventions and kind of emergency response from in terms of aid, medical aid. You know, I just received an, a message today from the head of the World Congress of Muslim Philanthropists kind of saying, you know, you didn't mention, I just had an article that was uh, published yesterday in Alliance magazine about the Arab philanthropy support um, and the gaps that haven't been filled. And so he reached out and said, I didn't see you mention anything about the World Congress of Muslim Philanthropists. And I was like, you know what? Tell us more about what has been, because there hasn't been enough information that's come out about where are the the, the key places that our sector has kind of intervened. Um, and and what I'm seeing from the vantage point in which I sit is that it's these individual, you know, these individual efforts that are the ones that have really kind of come in in the most meaningful way in the most critical time. And it's I know I understand, uh, Isra, that it's a little bit of a, you know, I'm putting you a bit on the spot when I say, like, what are you going to do next? Because you're already putting all of your, you know, <laughs> all of your efforts, all of your passion, all of your uh, volunteer time and all of that into this particular thing. But these are stopgap measures. And we know that even if this genocide ended today, right, we, there is no going back. This isn't a question of, oh, all these 150,000 families or 150,000 people that are in Egypt today are going to pack up their stuff and go home. There's nothing to go home to. So are you thinking about expanding what Ahfad al Zaytun becomes? Is that even on your agenda? Or And if it isn't, it doesn't need to be. I'm just asking, like, is that something that we're thinking about? So, you know, I our first phase was incredibly successful you know, seeing how the kids' mental health and even the parents' mental health, like that was our measure is like how they feel. They built a community, you know, we've we've kind of become a safe haven, not just for, you know, the, the kids and the parents, but also the volunteers, right? Because, they, you know, the Egyptian people and the Palestinian people, there has always been this like deep rooted connection. So the volunteers felt like, you know, they are giving something for their, their people. They, you know, and so the thing is like what I recognized is like our first phase was successful it was amazing um but it wasn't sustainable long term like we did not have funding um you know we everything was on the go um and you, I think what we are moving towards is like how can we make this sustainable long term how can we you know cover all overhead costs and uh, hire people to like help out and all of this stuff, um, because a lot of this like goes into um, making it sustainable for the next year, um, five years down the road. What the ask is, is I get on a daily basis messages from Egyptians. I want Ahfad Zaytun in Alexandria. I want mm -hmm. it in Ismailia. I want it in Al Arish so that I can volunteer there. So if I really want to take a step back and like look at the big vision, like Ahfed Zaytun is needed, you know, all over Egypt and maybe other areas too, where, um, you know, uh, people from Gaza were displaced. Um, right. We will always stay true to our model because I think it is what is what made this successful is to have it be volunteer run as a grassroots organization because you know there was so much love poured into it. And mm -hmm. we will, I believe that in terms of formal education, the responsibility should go on, you know, to the bigger NGOs, to the big, um, you know, official uh, organizations, because the, yeah. they have the resources to do that. What grassroots organizations like myself, we can be that space that, you know, nurtures the kids from their mental health to building the community. And that's what grassroots organizations, you know, thrive on. So our system will remain the same. Hopefully we are able to expand and, um, you know, create the sustainability that we need to continue. Because uh, as, as it stands right now, Ahfed uh, is very much reliant on me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I did not take a single day off. I was there every single day. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for it to be successful, we need to have it rely on, you know, more people to manage it. The volunteers sure. were an integral part of the success. However, they have their full time jobs. They have their other obligations. So inshallah, in the future, um, we are able to make this sustainable and make it long term. 
Amazing. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's also really important. I and mean, you just made a really, really critical point about, um, you know, sticking to your system and what and, and also recognizing and acknowledging and calling out, frankly, the responsibility of the larger NGOs to sort of fill their role as well. And I think that's very important in the success of grassroots uh, initiatives is that and you'll find this is thought this is going to come up a lot in the next couple of months, maybe years for you, is that people are going to want to take, want you to do this even bigger and better and for more things. And, you know, oh, do this for all of Egypt and do it for Egyptians and don't just do I already right? get that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. For sure. And it's very it's really important. Um, you know, I, I often have these conversations when we're talking about the sector, about everyone knowing that a the sector is very is varied. And it's, it's enriched only because it's varied. So not every small organization needs to be um, scaled up, right? Not every grassroots effort needs to become a full-fledged implementing NGO. There is space and there's a need for more grassroots efforts that are more localized, that are filling a very specific kind of need. And like you said, you know, bridging maybe that kind of gap between the NGO and the and 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 the community-based you know, um, smaller grassroots efforts. So knowing your place is also really important. And I think it it kind of helps you to be as impactful as you are, which is just, I mean, uh, just incredible, amazing. A side question, because I want to get to the question that Sa uh, Saeed just wrote, or Saeed, I don't know if it's Saeed or Saeed, um, but in the, in the Q&A, but I want to ask you, totally off topic, where's your shirt from? Because I love it. Um, it's from a, a it's a brand in Jordan. Uh, it's actually okay. uh, hand stitched by Palestinian refugees who are in Jordan. Um, okay. The brand is called uh, Baka 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 Baka. Baka. Okay. And, yeah, they employ all Palestinian uh, refugees, and they stitch, um, you know, original uh, stitching. So um, gorgeous. I, got, I love it. You know, Ahmed Zaytoun. So I I ran. Yeah. Um, and they have amazing, they do amazing work. And again, they're also a grassroots organization in Jordan. That's beautiful. If you can, I'm going to ask Dea this next question because it's relevant to her. So if you can put their, if they have a link or anything, if you can yes. put it in the chat for I'll everyone. I'll grab that it right now. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so Dea, the question that I want to ask you that came in in the Q&A um, so Saeed or Saeed, I'm not sure what the name is, but it says, I'm conducting independent research to reduce barriers to higher education and scholarships for Palestinians and have launched a displaced student survey. And he puts the link. And his question is, what can universities around the world do to make distance learning more accessible and give displaced students, particularly those in Egypt, an opportunity to apply for residency? Um, and is residency the first step? So I don't know that you have the answer to the residency question, but if you have the answer to from your learning and from what you've been doing around how can distance learning become more accessible? Well, first, I'd like to answer the question about universities. They have not stepped up uh, as they did for Ukraine and possibly Syria. I didn't do that study, um, unfortunately, uh, all over the world. They're slowly starting to do it now. Uh, mm -hmm. Long distance learning, you know, again, no one's really discussing how they can step up. The institutions around the world are still hesitant to engage. Um, I'm hoping this is going to change in the coming year. Uh, mm -hmm. On a weekly basis, uh, I'm informed of more scholarships. More people are reaching out to me and offering and asking for students uh, from Gaza. And so we're looking to place a lot more in 2025 should we get the the, the right kind of funding. Yes, we will help move. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. My answer is, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe people are doing enough. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot more that can be done. Uh, obviously, our youth from Gaza have lost their computers, the mm -hmm. majority of them, because of all the moving around. This is not an item that was carried with them. So uh, we do need to get uh, companies who make computers to step up on a very large scale to ensure that our students have the have these uh, tools, which are very important. You cannot study from a telephone, even though uh, a lot of our yep. youth in Lebanon study this way. Um, I'd like to commend Isra for her comment about vocational skills and vocational training. This is a very good option currently if we're not able to get the younger generation educated in universities, at least a skill 
um, mm -hmm. is is going to help them moving forward. And I think that's a very re realistic is really uh, working harder on development of vocational um, skills. Uh, overwhelming, I wanted to mention, make a comment, overwhelming. Yes, overwhelming. It is overwhelming. However, mm -hmm. um, failure is not an option and not stepping up to do something is also mm -hmm. not an option. Uh, and if uh, grassroots organizations like ours and and uh, and ISRA uh, just continue to doing this, the, the my hesitation to the larger organizations having learned about uh, the dysfunction in the NGO world, I'm not a big fan of NGOs myself, um, is that I'm not sure they're going to be doing it right. So I'm hoping that they come and that they receive uh, ob our observations, that they engage us in what we've learned, because I always say I don't care what, you know, the bigger the organization, the bigger the spin, right? Mm. And spin mm. is my polite word of what I really want to say. Um, I've learned everything from the students because they're the ones experiencing going through all of it. If a student tells me they've never heard of that NGO in their camp, then how effective can that NGO be, right? Mm. So um, I would like to just do say my favorite quote. Sorry about quoting because there's some great people who've said the right things way before. So I'm lazy and I take theirs. I'm going <laughs> to quote Malcolm. I'm going to quote Malcolm X. I use this quote a lot. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think it, uh, it resonates. So education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. And I know our humanitarian crisis deserves all the attention and all the funding we can give it. Mm -hmm. Our education crisis also deserves support. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, donors, you're talking about philanthropy, uh, a lot of donors are focusing on humanitarian and not so much on education. Uh, this is sort of a stopgap. And I don't think that it's wise to uh, ignore and neglect the fact that uh, so many of our youth and our gen younger generation are losing out on so much by not continuing mm -hmm. their education. This really needs to be addressed uh, on a very serious level and donors need to be encouraged um, we do have an issue. You asked me these questions about mechanisms for philanthropy and universities. Um, yes, we have a culturally we have a distrust for donating, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a very legitimate distrust because mm -hmm. we know our society and we know our culture and we know how things work. However, um, our program and I'm sure ISRA um, have a lot of very strong vetting processes in place. Um, and it's really very sad for me to understand that people are refusing to step up, even, you know, every penny counts, um, because they've heard of some people who've misused uh, their trust, because then, then those who really need it are the ones who suffer. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is what <clears throat> I've noticed. Uh, trust is a big issue. And then again, I'd like to see more universities stepping up and we're working on that too. I think that will come, unfortunately not mm -hmm. soon enough, but I do believe it will come in um, in the future years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, th that's a whole kind of huge conversation, another conversation that we can have around, you know, the, the sector and, and NGOs specifically, like the big kind of, you know, international NGOs and other NGOs and their role. Um, so with, you know, that's one of the things that I mentioned this article that I wrote, I'm just going to ask my team if they can go ahead and link it because that just was launched yesterday, the article uh, in Alliance magazine. And in fact, it's part of a series on the, the response to Gaza. So there are other Palestinian voices, um, not just my own, um, including the Rawa Fund and um, a, a few other uh, Palestinians working in the sector, talking about and calling out the sector for wh whether it's it's lack of of uh, initiative or it's you know lacking initiative. So not you know maybe some haven't um, completely ignored it, but haven't done enough, like you're saying. And and I think we're also you know it's 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 important for us as we call out these issues to also come to the table with solutions. And I think that's part of what this series has been so interesting about is that you know guests like you are bringing your solution to the table. And oh, like just in this conversation we just had today, Ale has already sent 
you know, Isra's uh, information onto her friend. Like there, people get to know about some of the the, the initiatives and the efforts that are happening um, around the region. So we're a little bit over time, about two minutes over time, but I'm just going to ask both of you to just give each one like a 30 second, just what is the last thing you want to say? We've shared all of your links. So people and, and everyone that's registered. So even though people who may not have attended, we had 70 registrants, about 20, 30 have joined. Um, so we'll send all this information to everyone after the the episode is over, as well as the recording of the episode, so people can watch it and also listen to it on wherever they get their podcasts, because we, we transfer everything onto podcasts. But just give me your last kind of 30 second thoughts. What would you like to leave people with? If it's a request, if it's a call to action, Isra, you know, I'm all about calls to action. So please feel free to do that. Um, yeah. So Isra, I'm going to ask you to go first. Okay. Um, you know, I think uh, Dia touched uh, on a great point, which is like distrust and mistrust. And when we first started, a lot of people did not believe that like this is a hundred percent volunteer run and operated. There was no funding. We all did this out of that. And as the parents got to know us, as we built a community, like um, I think it was one of the major things is like it restored hope that like there are people in this world that just want to get together and you know they 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 just want to do good because it makes them feel good because at the end of the day you know culturally that is what we are brought up you know with like our cultures for so many years ran on community support and this is like scaling down back to like at our core there was no big organizations coming to save us like we did this together and that is why we succeeded. And, uh, you know, like I said, yes, it is not like the most like sustainable long term to just 100 percent like rely on like volunteer run and operated and self-funded and all this stuff. Um, but like Dia said, it's also like, you know, like we get a lot of people who are like, um, I want to donate just like to get meals for the children or, you know, or um, just uh, clothes. And that is super important, but also like donating for the people that will like come and like teach you or like take care of your emotional needs, uh, be there for you. The space itself, that is just as important because again, like the goal is to strip these children away from education for them to just be you know, and, and remove their childhood. So creating these spaces are just as important as getting Absolutely. them food, as getting them water. Um, you know, so I hope, uh, and it's really was so great to see another organization that has such transparency as Dia's organization and also the same values um, and kind of the same path and experience. Uh, you know, um, the way we are making this sustainable is, um, you get to sponsor a kid that goes mm -hmm. into their, their books, um, the rent of the place covering overhead costs. And mm -hmm. the way we do it is you can sponsor them for a day, for a month or for the term, which is three months. And uh, we also like created a document to share with any donors who are um, curious to see what the operational cost is, because at the end of the day, our goal is to just maintain the space, take as many kids as possible and get them to this, the position where the first phase kids got to, which is being children again, being able to mm. smile, um, creating a community and also supporting the parents and like having this space where we just like, anytime anyone has a bad day, whether it's the parents, mm. the volunteers, we get there and we feel so much better because it's, yeah. it's the energy of the place that we've created together. So thank Amazing. you so much for giving me um, this platform to meet other like-minded people and hopefully foster and, you know, uh, a, just make our community bigger. So thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Isra. Honestly, thank you so much. And just you and your volunteers, like just every, it's just incredible. I'm so moved, really. Thank you. Dia, go for it. Your closing uh, statement. No, I'm, making, I'm going to make it short and sweet. Uh, it's overwhelming. The need is overwhelming. But if you look at it one young person at a time, if you realize and understand that if everybody steps up $20, $10, $100, you don't have to give $1,000, which is usually the response I get from, uh, from donors. Oh, D, I can't, I can't give you a thousand. I didn't ask for a thousand. 
It's mm -hmm. a numbers game. If everybody steps up, they get their friends to step up. $20, $50 monthly is fantastic. Uh, that makes our work possible. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be overwhelming. And then you get your friends. You'd be surprised how many people are saying, how can we step up? How can we help? Oh, absolutely. Put oh, it out absolutely. there to your friends. You know, yeah. put yeah. the word out of, about uh, programs that you believe in. Um, and that's really all it takes. That's that's really all I have to say. Action. Amazing. Action, action. action. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much, both of you, really. I'm so grateful. And um, it's just, it's it's moving. It's inspiring. It's really, it's just, it's incredible, you know. Um, yeah, so here's another amazing kind of... Uh, representation of what's being done for our our communities in Gaza and our Palestinian people and Palestinian children. Um, we will be having another episode on, I believe it's October, I'm not sure what day, Nihal can confirm, it's either October 7th or 8th. Um, it will be with Ghassan Abu Sitta, Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta. Um, it will be the anniversary, one year later, which I can't even believe we're saying this. Um, so join us then. We will share this incredibly rich discussion with all of you later, with all of the links and everything, including the links to get uh, Isra's amazing shirt. Um, <laughs> and yeah, until then, thank you everyone so much and free Palestine. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.